Hey viewers and welcome to my channel. Welcome to Afro Political TV. If you are new, hey, I hope you're doing well and if you are already a subscriber, thank you so much for coming back. In light of everything that's going on, I really wanted to commit myself to highlighting some influential leaders both here and gone. So for the next few weeks, I will be introducing you to 10 leaders you may or may not have heard of. Africa's history is vast, deep and rich, and I'm really excited to get stuck in. So I picked two leaders from each region of the continent and we will be starting with Central Africa. So let's get into the video. So I wanted to kick this off with one of the most outrageous leaders, one of Africa's most diabolical dictators, the self-proclaimed emperor of the Central African Republic, Jean Bedel Bokassa. Commonly known as Bokassa I, his affinity for all things French began in his childhood when he witnessed his father's brutal death after he attempted to resist the forced labour imposed by the French. Following a French education in the CAR and the DRC, he joined the French colonial troops in 1939. Bacasa rose through the ranks and eventually relocated to Indochina, where he married a Vietnamese national and fathered his first of 54 children, allegedly. Two years after the CAR gained independence, Bokassa returned to the country and led a coup against the sitting president, David Dako, who was also his cousin. And this is where everything goes left. When Bokassa ascended to power, Dako was thrown into prison, he formed a new government, annulled the constitution, dissolved the National Assembly and spent the country's money. He also quashed a coup attempt by personally killing the rebel leader. And this was just in the first three years of power. Now, in the beginning, he did do some good, like abolishing female circumcision and creating public transportation links. But his love for French recognition would continue to play a crucial role in his decision making and spending habits. By 1972, Bacassa had declared himself president for life and began making steps towards turning the CAR into a monarchical institution governed by military rule. He renamed the CAR the Central African Empire and in 1977 threw himself the most lavish coronation costing the country almost 10 million pounds despite the amount of poverty and disease in the country. In doing this, he used up all of the country's foreign aid. Though dignitaries like Idi Amin and Mobutu Sese Seko were invited to this coronation, nobody attended. At the coronation, Bokassa sat on a two-ton golden eagle throne and wore a diamond crown designed and made by a Parisian jeweler. By the time this was all said and done, he had become an international laughing stock and eventually lost French support. This also meant that he would lose out on French financial support and so he turned to Muammar Gaddafi. He converted to Islam in the hopes that he would receive assistance from Gaddafi, but that didn't happen so he went back to Christianity. Finally, in 1979, a food riot took hold of the capital city, Bangui, and Bokassa retaliated by killing hundreds of civilians. The straw that broke the camel's back was the imprisonment and murder of a hundred school children, which launched the French invasion of the country to overthrow Bokassa. He did manage to escape and live in exile for a few years, but eventually did return to the CAR to stand on trial for his crimes in 1986. He was found guilty and placed in solitary confinement until 1993, eventually passing in 1996. So we are staying in Central Africa for our next leader but heading to Angola to take a look at Africa's richest woman, Isabel dos Santos. You may have heard of Isabel dos Santos, especially in the last few years surrounding certain allegations. I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible but as per usual, all of my links are in the description box so you can read up on both figures in your own time. 
Isabel dos Santos is the oldest of former Angolan president Jose Eduardo dos Santos. Now being born into a presidential family does sometimes guarantee financial wealth, but how does this translate to becoming Africa's first female billionaire? Before we get into that, let's take a look, little look into her background. Dos Santos studied electrical engineering at King's College where she met her Congolese husband and son of a millionaire, Sindika Dokolo. She has investments in many industries such as a nightclub, telecoms, banking, oil, diamonds and other private investments, all of which she had access to while her father was president. She is the president of Angola's Red Cross and a shareholder of a satellite TV provider that had the rights to distribute Forbes in some Portuguese speaking countries. So I'm not going to go into her businesses because her portfolio is so diverse and she has her hand in a whole lot of pies. So it's not my forte. We're going to move on. In 2015, she was named as one of the 100 most influential women in the world by the BBC, namely for her role in the African economy and African development. Isabel's father ruled Angola for 38 years and close to the end of his presidency in 2016, Isabel dos Santos was made the head of Angolan state oil firm Sonango. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Thus commencing what Dos Santos called a witch hunt against her and her family. The current Angolan president, Joao Lourenço, sorry for my pronunciation, was thought to be a successor of the Dos Santos family who would usher in a new era in Angola. However, as soon as he was made president, he removed Isabel Dos Santos um, as head of Sonango in 2017. He immediately launched an investigation into how the Dos Santos family amassed enough wealth for Isabel to be worth over $2 billion. He has called for the return of over $100 billion, which he believes was plundered between 2002 and 2017, the time in which Isabel's father was president. Then, in January 2020, came Luanda Leaks. The Luanda Leaks saga is a cachet of 720. 15,000 documents including emails, charts, presidential decrees, contracts and many others which breaks down how Dos Santos amassed her wealth. Needless to say, it is not good. Both Dos Santos and her husband are linked to companies in Portugal, Sao Tome and Principe, Belgium, Angola, everywhere. Now I want to make it clear that corruption and billions of questionable wealth is not unique to Africans. There are many countries like France, Portugal and the UK who benefit from the plundering of national wealth. They are the first to report on it but they do not highlight how companies based in the West aid and abet wealthy people who steal public funds from African countries. So please do not take this as me placing a negative light on Africa. Isabel Dos Santos is at the forefront of this investigation, but there are hundreds of people who were bought and or coerced to allow things like this to happen. They are just not on trial by the media. So what is happening with Isabel Dos Santos now? Well, her accounts have been seized. She's currently residing in Portugal and still contests that her wealth is not from stolen funds. I don't know, what do you all think? I do think it's interesting though that Isabel is the face of this whole thing, you know, Angola isn't exactly paradise, so how do we only hold one person accountable for that amount of funds? What about the other political figures in power at the time? Uh, the Western companies that accepted funds, or maybe I'm not well versed in these things, again, I don't know. Anyway... Thank you for watching this video. I will be focusing on two leaders from the south of Africa in my next video. In the meantime, check out my other content and please subscribe to my channel. Every single subscriber counts. Help a sister out. See you next week. Bye.